interview with Barry Garari, tape number six. We were talking about um, uh, settling into uh, 770 Eastern Parkway. Before we get to that, we, and we had talked a little about your grandparents' household items, when you left Otsvotsk, was there anything special you took with you? I, in that environment, what I took with me, uh, in Otsvotsk, I don't, I don't know, we packed my stuff together with everybody else's. Each one, uh, an Orthodox Jew, carries with him a talus and a tefillin, tfil and the cedar, things of this sort. And uh, there were some manuscripts that were precious to me. So I had a large, uh, a large uh, handbag. The bag was probably the size of uh, maybe, uh, it's just a large briefcase, size of an attache case, something like that. That was what I carried with me throughout the bombings. Now, grandfather, of course, had more. He had the same kind of content in his own little bag, which was intended, again, size of a very large attaché case. And then that was his talus and film and a few important uh, manuscripts. Then, in addition to this, he had two manuscripts filled with two uh, uh, attaché case size things, filled with manuscripts. Yeah, perhaps a little larger than attaché case, but the reason they were always packed in a manuscript in a uh, attaché case is that in the years that he remembered and that I remember, house fires were not so uncommon. So very precious things used to be kept always ready to move. In fact, in the Barich, I remember being told that there were periods when they had the horses in the droshke, uh, arranged so that the horses were uh, put into their proper place in the droshke so that one could uh, drive away quickly. So one could take away some of the very important things out of the fire. Well, uh, during the, uh, the foot trip from Granichna to uh, Nalevki 7, three of the young people with us, three boys, carried these three packages, these three attaché cases. One of them was lost, the one that had my grandfather Stalas and Phil. So, grandfather borrowed my Tfilin for until he got himself better ones. So both of us used those. I still have those three. And uh, those are the things that were, were particularly precious. Now, there were various things that were very lovely, very important, very valuable in grandmother's uh, packages and grandfather's packages, such as life. Getting back to Brooklyn, could you describe your adjustment to life in New York <laughs> and in Brooklyn? Well, during the first half year, <coughs> when we were still in Greystone Hotel, I was studying as much English as I possibly could with various kinds of help. And uh, I was uh, walking the streets from time to time when I had a chance. I found that in general, uh, during that period, my load in terms of helping grandfather, had decreased, and it was for several reasons. Uh, first, he had a nurse that came with us from the sanitarium in Riga. Uh, second, his care was much better organized. He needed less of mother's help, he needed less of my help. He had better medical attention, better, better medicines. Uh, then I couldn't, I could no longer serve as well in, in other ways because I really wasn't that familiar with the United States. I couldn't serve in terms of helping him with Americans. I was not a suitable intermediary. So that gave me more time. I began to think about my own future. 
and uh, I studied English as much as I could. Then by the time we moved to Eastern Parkway, we got the top floor, as I've already mentioned, on 770. And I began going to a regular yeshiva. Now, of course, the Lubavitcher yeshiva was being built, but the Lubavitcher yeshiva at that stage was still very uh, make, makeshift, very in its very beginnings. And my grandfather, my father, and my mother all thought that it would be a good idea if I went to a place which was much more stable, just as a way of helping me have a more stable environment. Uh, I started going to Yeshiva Torah Das in Williamsburg. And that's where I continued later my studies. Now, Yeshiva Torah Das, of course, was an American Yeshiva. And therefore, it had a high school. The law requires a high school. So I started going to the Yeshiva and also to the high school. And I tried to catch up. I was 17. By 17, I should have graduated high school. By 17, by 18, I was nowhere near that. So in one way or another, I started taking sub various subjects home study. Uh, a year passed by, and I had taken enough of courses so I could now graduate with one more semester. The principal of Torah Vadas High School looked at me and said, look, you're in trouble. With all of these courses, home study, if I ever let you take the regents from our place, regents are going to come and they will say that I'm not running a bona fide school. It's a phony outfit. I can't afford that. You better go to another high school, graduate from it. We'll give you all the credits, but they should graduate you. I talked to him to letting me finish a few regions exams at, uh, at uh, Yeshiva, and then I went to uh, the high school. Now, that high school happened to have been an evening high school, of course. And the evening high school was in Brooklyn on uh, Fulton Street, which was a poor black section. It turned out to be very good for me. My classmates turned out to be mostly, uh, many, mostly women, mostly black, mostly day workers or maids. And they used to come there after a day's hard work. I learned uh, to respect those people a great deal. That's what I can say. Now, uh, after graduation from that, I began to say to, to think to myself, well, some people sit at a yeshiva and they study for the rest of their lives. I don't want to do that. So what do I want? Well, I want to have some kind of an appropriate endpoint. The endpoint would be smicha, now it's ordination as a rabbi. So I studied the Yoradeh and other sh aspects of the Shulchan Aruch very intensively for a while. And at the same time, late in 43, I began attending Brooklyn College, evening, high school, evening school. So by 1945, I got smicha, and I already had a few college credits, and I was doing reasonably well. Uh, it's difficult to do well when you are a newcomer and uh, when you study in the evenings, because it turns out you can take a maximum of 10, ten, uh, uh, 10 credits. And of course, I needed at the time 120 to graduate. Now, from what does that add up to? <laughs> a rather large number of years. So I began to figure, what can I do to get out of there faster? get my degree faster. By now I was, going for f I was going there studying physics, and I gradually came to know Professor Kerlmeyer. I was taking a, an advanced laboratory uh, course of his. Professor Kerlmeyer was the typical German, 
typically all his habits were German. His appearance was German. His father was a professor of German. He was a professor of physics. He was my professor of physics, and lo and behold, he had many Jewish students, and he was very decent to them, in fact, very kind to them. I began to see a different world. Somehow a German could be a decent person. You know, after, after having been through Poland and uh, Germany, it wasn't so clear. But this man disabused me of that. And I'm grateful to him for that. In addition to that, he happened to have a wife who was also a physicist, and she was an assistant professor at Columbia. Assistant professor because in those days women didn't advance very much beyond that. But she was a smart woman, and she gave me a job as an assistant in her, uh, in her uh, laboratory. First I took her laboratory course. Even though I wasn't quite quali qualified for it, we sort of got around it. And then uh, she introduced me to Professor Rabi, a very prominent physicist, who was head of the department. And she introduced me to Professor Willis Lamb. Willis Lamb <coughs> was the head of the Columbia Radiation Lab, which was a contract organization in the lab, in the, uh, in the university. So, Somehow they managed to get me in as a contingent, as a uh, conditional graduate student. So I now was an, I was an assistant who was getting paid very well, $150 a month. In those days, remember this was 1940, 42, excuse me, 43, no, 44, excuse me. But still, uh, $150 for half time was quite good. So I had money. And two, uh, she talked Professor Lamb into accepting me as a, an assistant in his place. So I now, well, th this was where I was getting the money. But she, th she was the one who helped me for, with that. And then, uh, gradually, I became a, gra a matriculated student. And I was doing very well there. Then my assistantship ran out. So I went to the math department. You know, you can have an assistantship only for three years. Well, I went to the math department and got myself a teaching job. Math professor, Professor Levi, looked at me and said, well, you're taking away a teaching assistantship, which I would be giving to one of my students. You go back to physics. I went back to physics and complained bitterly. Uh, somehow Professor Levy changed his mind very quickly. It seemed that he had a, quite a bit of pressure exercised on it. <laughs> and so I was able to work as a math teacher, teaching geometry, uh, analytic geometry, calculus to students, and at the same time study. And uh, as soon as I got my smicha, which was ordina my ordination, from Torah I became a day student. No, excuse me, I became a day student in Brooklyn College. I'm conf confusing some things. No, but in any case, it, it, that process saved me a lot of time <laughs> with getting into graduate school. Then in 1950, early 1950, in February, my grandfather passed away. And the place was now suddenly a no man's land. First, people were confused about direction which way to go. Secondly, they were thinking about the successor. In my mind, the successor to grandfather was ridiculous. It would be a totally different place. And so some people told me, well, you're a direct descendant. I said, forget it. Uh, the choice was between father and, gran and uncle. That is my uncle Schneerson. Uncle Hornstein, of course, never made it out of Poland. He was killed there. And that was a very, very unpleasant and a vicious kind of a fight. I had been very friendly with my uncle at one time, but uh, the kind of uh, 
dirty tricks that his followers did, he at least tolerated it, forced me to break off with him. In any case, there came a point when I began to feel that this place was coming apart, and I couldn't really, uh, having just been through the, the short part of it, I couldn't really stay there very much longer. So I began to look for a job. The place I was going to look at was Washington, because I'd been told that Jews could get jobs in government positions. In those days, that wasn't so obvious, you know. There were many places where still had a glass door that was firmly locked when the Jew came. And so I went for a number of interviews. I got four offers in Washington, and I got one offer at Westinghouse Atomic Research Project in Pittsburgh. And five offers. I took the one at uh, the National Bureau of Standards. Now it is, uh, now it is the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology, which is a government organization. And uh, very soon after I came there, I realized I had taken the wrong job. Uh, why? Because I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite make friends. I couldn't quite make. Uh, I found it up being isolated. Uh, not all the fault was by the bureau, it was that of the Bureau. Partly it was mine. I went uh, to Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, which was in Silver Spring. It was a government contract organization, primarily concerned with guided missiles. And it was a totally different kind of a place. The research center there was he headed by a gentleman named Frank, Frank Trollfort McClure, or we called him Mac. Everybody called him Mac. He was an Irishman, a Canadian Irishman with the gift of the gab. And he was delightful in many ways. He was difficult and delightful both. <laughs> but in any case, I took the job there. And I made many friends there. I stayed there for almost 10 years until, well, I got married. Mina and I got married in 1953. I stayed at Johns Hopkins till 1960. And I made some of my contributions to the war effort, or to the post-war effort which I, for one, felt uh, was very important, because my, in my view, America was the one decent force in the, U in the world, and we needed strength. Not just the ability to talk tough, but possibly talk softly, but carry the big stick, and we needed that big stick badly. So later I switched from there to uh, Westinghouse Research Labs, that was largely for qu questions of personal advancement. And we couldn't stay. Uh, Westinghouse Research was a nice place. I couldn't stay there very long because both Mina and I developed allergies. In those days, Pittsburgh had a lot of uh, smoke and other harmful emissions in the air. And so uh, we had to move out of there. Found a place in United Aircraft, which was in West Hartford. And that turned out to be a very nice place. And I stayed there for, what is it, uh, about six years. Then I took another, again for personal advancement, I took a job in in um, ITT. At the time, it was an abbreviation for International Telephone and Telegraph, but staff members used to say the ITT stood for International Talk and Travel. It was primarily a conglomerate. It had a large defense part, but it also was buying up companies of all kinds. And uh, 
I found that it was a very interesting place. Uh, I was a director of technology for the Defense Space Group. And the, the, I had to travel a good deal. It took me more into politics and less into science than I had preferred. And so after a certain period, we parted company. And I st by that time, I was living here. And so we, uh, I started a little company called Gorari Associates, Inc., which survived until, well, it was uh, disbanded this year because I'm no longer able to carry on that kind of an activity for, physical, for medical reasons. Now, in the meantime, I have uh, I've forgotten to mention Nina's changes. Before you do that, could yeah. you tell me about how you met her? How I met Nina? Well, there is the fact of life that her father and mine shared rooms at uh, the yeshiva in the Babich. It's a little, a little part of it. I met Nina, well, at least what I remember, Soon after we came to the United States, she probably was at the dock to welcome us. But then when I, we were in, uh, at the Hotel Greystone, uh, my grandmother needed lots of help. My grandmother was totally deaf. She had become deaf during the birth of her last child, Sonia. So she really needed help in terms of doing things. And my mother needed help. And uh, Nina was always willing to give it. And she also helped me to get acquainted with uh, America, like helping me visit the World's Fair in 1940, various other things. Later, she moved to, uh, she completed school in the meantime. She got a Masters in Statistics from Columbia in 1949. And soon thereafter, she moved to Washington. She got herself a job at, Johnson, at, uh, at the Logistics Research Project at the George Washington University as a logistician. Then she went on a world tour. She had money of her own by now. So she went on a world tour. When she came back, I had in the meantime decided to move someplace out of, out of uh, New York. And I must confess that one of the thoughts in my mind when I decided on Washington was that I knew at least one person there, Mina. I came there, and she took off on her world tour, and I was furious. <laughs> I couldn't say it, but I was furious. <laughs> anyway, she came back after some months, and that's how things developed. And what was your wedding like? Our wedding was not what I would have liked it to be. By that time, my grandfather had passed away. My uncle was uh, sort of rather very unfriendly towards my father. I wanted my father to officiate at the wedding, not my uncle. And the only way I could do that was by not inviting uncle, which was regarded as a bad insult. Well, the result was that they made it impossible to, for father to attend the wedding. Such is life. We got married anyway. And uh, Mina turned out to be a very good daughter-in-law anyway. So that's how we met. And our, gradually our children came. And Mina gradually gave up her work. For the first one, she continued working. But when the second one came, she decided to stop for a while. So there was a period of about eight or nine years that she didn't work. So when the kids went into school, she became very 
board. So she had one master's in statistics. She decided that she wanted to learn more about management. We were living in West Hartford at the time, so she went to the University of Hartford and she got an MBA. And then gradually she got into the uh, stock market. She's now still a registered representative. She's smarter than I am, and she wasn't uh, retired by illness as quickly as I was. I hope it continues for good health, that is. And could you tell me a little about your children? Yes. My older one, Sonia, named in honor of my aunt, who perished in Poland. Uh, I'll have to show you her picture. She was a slow starter. She was a premature child. She was a slow starter. But she was caught up very nicely. And she has a master's degree in microbiology. She nowadays is an assistant director of uh, regulatory affairs in a large firm. My younger one is named Nora. Actually, the correct name is Nora Sterna. Nora Sterna is not an easy name to use for daily purposes, so we added the Nora. Nora Stern. She's named after my great grandmother. And uh, she has taken a bachelor's degree in business administration. And then she met a young physician who, at a wedding, interestingly enough, this was a wedding of a girl with whom she and that girl together had attended the same Jewish day school. So she was invited to that wedding. She met him. She liked him. He liked her. And so her married name is Friedman. And she lives in Teaneck now. She now has three little girls and a very busy husband. And she herself works also in the, in the medical office. My son-in-law, as I said, is a cardiologist. And what effect uh, do you think your experiences have had on the way you raised your children? Oh, it's difficult to say. It certainly had to do with the fact that we sent them to a Jewish day school because we wanted them to have a strong bond. I have not told them the story too many times. I've written it up for them. You've seen the write-up. But I have not tended to, because I, I feel that so much of it, I didn't want to convey a message of hate. Care, yes. Being very careful. Being, uh, making sure you know where you are, you know with whom you are, you provide for yourself. And you always know who, are you, who your real friends are. But uh, I want to avoid hate. We'll continue on the next tape.